Hello everyone. Welcome to David Griffith's Electrodynamics Problem 2.26. So I have sort of run out of time. Um, I'm not, I, I'm kind of busy on time and I went ahead and solved the problem, which I always do anyways, but usually what I do is resolve the problem for you guys. And I know most of you guys like that format. However, on this video just in particular, because of my time constraints and it's, it's quite involved problem, a lot of math. So I'm just gonna kind of walk through my solution. And so what I do is, I, what I suggest, I guess, is you know, since I, you guys are gonna be writing slower than I can talk, um, I suggest that you guys just um, kind of pause the video and, and take it at your own pace as I explain my solution. So uh, let's get started. So. The problem statement says that we want to, uh, we have a conical surface, which is just an empty ice cream cone. So the space in the cone is empty. However, the surface carries a uniform charge density of sigma and the height of the cone is H as well as the radius. And I didn't really draw that well to scale here because this looks longer than the radius. However, um, just, for <laughs> just for problem purposes, assume that this length and this length here is the same length. And it wants us to find the potential difference between uh, the tip here, the, the vertex, and this point on the center, in the center of the cone here. So what the potential difference between these two points is. So initially what I did was I wrote down the equation for the potential, which is one over four pi plus one naught, the integral of the charge density over um, <clears throat> the distance um, to the point and, and do tau. In this case, since we're dealing with um, area charge, uh, surface charge, uh, the, the form of the integral is sigma dA instead of rho d tau. So first, you know, the easy part is calculating the, what's the potential, uh, to find the potential difference, we need to know the potential at each of the points in, in particular. So what is the potential at A? Well, sigma dA in, um, I guess, uh, spherical or, or this would be, um, yeah, I guess spherical coordinates. Uh, we can write that as sigma r, so sigma and then dA would be r dr uh, d theta and, oh, but I forgot, sine of theta. So r sine of theta dr d theta. And that's what I did here. So I've essentially written this integral out here. So I've written the d theta part, or I guess here d phi. Um, I think I meant to write this as, okay, I, I guess not d theta. Okay, so what I meant here was this angle phi is the angle that goes around the polar plane and um, so it goes all the way around 2 pi. Theta, though, and this, when I, when I say theta, I've defined theta here as this angle from the vertical axis. So I don't want you guys to get confused. You can easily replace theta here with, with phi or whatever. Um, but anyways, um, so we have this phi integral that's going to go from 0 to 2 pi, d phi. And we have the 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught. Then for this inside area, well, sigma is just a constant. Then we have um, r sine of theta, and I've written sine of pi over four here, and you'll see why. So r sine of theta um, dr, and then over r prime. And so first of all, let me explain why this is sine of pi over four. Um, if you have a triangle here whose sides are the same, and you're trying to find the hypotenuse, well, that's easy to find using uh, Pythagoras' theorem. You can show that this side, the hypotenuse side, is square root of two over h, or square root of two times h. And you can also use tangent of theta to show that this is one, and this shows that uh, theta must be pi over four. So you can figure out that um, the angle here is actually pi over four because these two lengths are fixed, which fixes this length. So this is a fixed angle. Okay, so that's why I have sine of pi over four here. And then why I wrote the script R as R is because 
um, in this case, for this point here, all of the points of charge um, on, the, on the cone are all equidistant, um, at least polar. Like it, any point on the cone drawing from that point to A is a constant distance as you go around. And as you get higher and higher, um, it goes, you know, it, it's always an equal distance for each radius or circle of the, of the cone, each piece. So I've just written that as this variable r prime. <clears throat> and then sine of pi over 4 is just um, 1 over root 2. And so as you can see here, this integral evaluates to 2 pi. And then um, I have the 4 pi epsilon naught, and, um, which I cancel with the 2 pi. And so we just have a 2 on the bottom. And then I pulled out the 1 over root 2 from the sine of pi over 4. So we have sigma 2 pi over 2 times 4 pi epsilon naught square root, root 2, which I cancel a bunch of stuff out. And then we have r dr. Um, you know, I, sh I should have written this as uh, the prime variables. Um, but anyways, it doesn't really matter. Uh, this r cancels with the r on the bottom. And all you're really integrating is with respect to dr. So you have another very simple integral. So this just becomes square root 2h. So really, all we have here from this integral is sigma divided by 2 uh, square root of 2 times epsilon naught, and then multiplied by square root of 2 times h. And so the square roots of 2 cancel out. And you get that the potential at this point a is just sigma times h over 2 epsilon naught. So that is our first uh, part. So we know the potential here at point A. Now, let's move on to the potential at point B, which is up here, which is a bit more uh, involved. So I started doing this here. So the potential at B I've written. So we have 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught. Then we have um, the integral of d phi again from 0 to 2 pi, because we're still integrating. We have to integrate all the charge you know, all around the entire cone. And then sigma um, r dr. And the sine of theta, I already knew was sine of pi over 4, so I already wrote 1 over root 2 here. Um, I just did that in my head. So all we're left with is sigma r dr. However, the distance script r is now, if you think about any sort of piece of... Um, charge on the sphere, it's really going to be this distance um, that is the script R. And so ignore this up here. I, I, I messed, this is me when I originally wrote the problem, I kind of messed up. So this script R is not what the script R is. Um, and as you can see here, I kind of drew it over here. Um, this sort of, this is kind of what we're dealing with. So script R is what we need to find. And what I did to, to solve that is just, since I know this angle, I can just use the law of cosines to figure out what this is, um, knowing these two sides. So we're little, we're little r here is just the radial distance going up the cone. And so script r squared using the law of cosines then is r squared plus h squared minus 2rh cosine of this angle pi over 4. So plugging in pi over 4, you get r squared plus h squared minus 2 divided by the root 2 times rh. And so that's what we use for the integral here um, for script r. And so now this integral is quite hard to solve. Um, it's not really solvable in this form. So we do some algebra to manipulate it. Um, and I believe what I did here was complete the square. So I took um, this term here, I squared it um, and divided it by two. So I took that term divided by two and squared it and I got h squared over two. Um, and then here I just subtracted that over to this side. 
I then added the term to complete the square to both sides so that it stays the same. Um, if you don't know how to complete the square, um, I would just suggest looking up a video on it. Um, but all I'm doing is taking what's the inside of the square root, not the square root itself, but what's inside and, and completing the square with it because it's just in the form of, you know, a squared plus uh, a r, you know, a, a x squared plus b x plus c is zero, uh, or not zero, equal to zero, but, you know, I'm just doing this to complete the square. So from here, we can factor this side now. So the left side can be written as r minus h over square root of two, whole squared, and then just moving this back over to the other side, I can add the h squared over two. Um, so this term in the square root can be written as this in a bit simpler form. And so all I did here was rewrite the integral and pull out constants and I evaluated the phi integral. So we have sigma 2 pi, which are our constants. We have the square root of 2 from the sine, of, um, the sine um, term and then four pi epsilon naught. So that's, those are our constants. Then we have our integral running, still running from zero all the way up. You know, we still have to integrate as we go up, you know, each of these distances as we go up. Um, so it's gonna go from zero to root two times h. And then we have r dr, and then the square root of this term now, which is what we got from completing the square here. And sorry if you can hear some fire, uh, fire trucks outside. They are going off near my apartment. All right, sorry about that. I paused the video for just a second so that the fire, uh, the sirens would stop. All right, so we have our square root here now in this form, which is just in the form of x minus b whole squared plus b squared which is a recognizable form um, for a trig substitution. So in this case, what I do is let r minus h um, over root two, which is the x minus b term. And I'm gonna set that equal to um, b tangent of theta. So in this case, it's h over two tangent of theta. And dr then is h over root two secant squared of d theta. Um, and then using this substitution and plugging it in, we find we have our constants out here still, nothing changed with that. Um, R then becomes uh, h over two, root two times one plus tangent of theta. So you can get that from solving here. So adding that over and factoring out. So that becomes R and then this is dr, and using using the substitution done here, you can get um, this in the form. So if r is that, you can simplify this um, expression down here. You can factor out h over root two, and just have the square root of one plus tangent squared of theta. And then the bounds now go from using um, this substitution here, instead of, of being zero to root two h, it's gonna be uh, negative pi over four to pi over four. All right. And then finally, let's see, I think this is the last section. So we have our constants out here still, nothing changed with those. Um, we have negative pi over four to pi over four. And what I did was square root of one plus tangent squared um, is the same as just secant of theta because one plus tangent squared is secant squared and the square root of squ secant squared is just secant. And then over here, remember uh, this h bar two on the bottom and this one on the top cancels. So those go away. We just have one on the top, which is shown here. And we still have one plus tangent theta and then multiply by secant squared d theta, but one of these secants will cancel um, so the secant on the bottom is gone. Then what do we have? So um, I end up canceling two pi and the four pi. So we just have a two on the bottom. Um, 
we have an H uh, come out and the root two and the root two cancel, giving us just two. And then we still have our bounds and all we have here for the integral is one plus tangent theta times secant of theta d theta. So this can be split up into two different integrals over the sum. So we have our constants here, which turn out to be just be sigma h divided by two epsilon times two. So this was really just gonna be four, but I decided not to multiply them for whatever reason. And then all that's multiplied by these two integrals. So we have the first integral, which is just secant of theta from negative pi over four to pi over four, plus another integral of tangent theta times secant theta d theta from negative pi over four to pi over four. However, you can use a nice trick um, because this here is an odd function, tangent of theta times secant of theta is an odd function. And if you ever integrate an odd function over a um, complete interval like this, over a complete interval of two pi, uh, then it's zero. So that's a handy trick when doing integration is if you integrate an odd function over a complete interval like this, it'll be zero. So this integral goes away. Um, and we're just left with the interval uh, the integral of secant of theta d theta. And all I did was multiply this by two so that I can get rid of the lower bound and replace it with zero because um, the, so this is these two are equivalent. So just, you know, this integral times two is the same as this integral. So that cancels one of the twos on the bottom. Um, and then we just have a standard integral. So all I did was at this step, I just kind of looked up um, the standard integral of secant of theta, which is the natural log of secant of theta plus tangent of theta, um, which should be something you should just keep in your head. The integral of secant of theta is natural log of secant of theta plus tangent of theta. And so we have sigma h over two epsilon naught multiplied by natural log of secant theta plus tangent theta. And we have to evaluate this from zero to pi over four. So, you know, I just keep the constants out and I plug in my bounds. So we have secant theta, secant of pi over four plus tangent of pi over four minus natural log of secant theta, or secant of zero plus tangent of zero. And so this first term becomes the natural log of secant of pi over four is root two. Tangent of pi over four is one, so we have natural log of root two plus one. Then we have natural log of secant of zero plus tangent of zero. This ends up just being natural log of one, and the natural log of one is zero. So this term goes away, and we're just with, left with um, sigma h over two epsilon naught times natural log of one plus root two. And so this ends up being the potential for um, the point B. And then finally, once now that we have both of the potentials, we can um, successfully find the potential difference between our two points. So all we have to do is subtract um, the potential of B and the potential of A. And so VB minus V of A is equal to sigma H over two epsilon naught natural log of one plus root two minus sigma H over two epsilon naught. So just factor out that common factor. And the answer, is sigma h over two epsilon naught all multiplied by the natural log of one plus root two uh, minus one. So this is our answer. Um, if something here does not make sense or you, or you caught a mistake of mine, please feel free to let me know. I do realize that you guys prefer the videos where I start from scratch. Um, but just due to my time constraints and work, um, I'm just super busy right now. And so I just couldn't find the time to sit down and resolve this because it does take quite a while. So I do hope that you guys at least appreciate having this solution regardless. If I went too fast, just pause the video, rewind, um, or take the time to just write down, you know, as you go at your, at your leisure. So thank you guys for watching. Um, I will get started now on the rest of the problems. Problem 2.27 is coming up next. And yeah, finishing out 27, 28, and 29 for this little section. So thank you guys for watching and have a great day.